Hey everybody, Cameron Golly here. Welcome to the first ever episode of the Growth Hack Podcast. So growing companies is something I am truly passionate about. Having spent the last nine years leading a digital marketing agency that's focused on a creative, data-informed approach to helping clients grow, I've had the chance to work with a ton of entrepreneurs, marketers, both large and small, all these brands, and I wanted to share some of that advice and insights for you that I've learned, as well as some of those stories from the people that have successfully grown their businesses. So this week, I'm joined by Matt Alexander, the CEO and founder of Neighborhood Goods, which is basically the reinvention of the department store concept. So in this episode, Matt and I will discuss the future of retail, growth strategies of a digitally native vertical brand, and we get to talk about raising venture capital in this kind of overarching climate. So stick in there, stay with me, and welcome to episode one of the Growth Hack. All right, so episode one of the Growth Hack. This is pretty exciting. I've got... uh, Matt Alexander from Neighborhood Goods in here. Thanks for coming on the show today, Matt. Uh, thank you for having me, Matt. Yeah, yeah, this is exciting. Um, you know, so Matt, Matt, you gr- you heard the accent right there. So Matt grew <laughs> up in London, and he can tell you a little bit about this, but grew up in London, uh, came to SMU, been here ever since, basically. And honestly, Matt and I, you know, we both live here in Dallas, and uh, you've been part of this tech scene and helping mentor a lot of tech startups and companies and accelerators, and you're part of the executive board for SMU. So uh, you're, you're really, you know, dialed into the Dallas scene and everything else. But um, the reason we, you know, really wanted to have you on today is because, uh, honestly, there's a lot of disruption in the world of retail right now. Um, and um, you've got this amazing new startup uh, called Neighborhood Goods we want to talk a lot about. But... Um, a little bit about you. I mean, you and I, like going back on this, I'm thinking like 2015, we were at South by Southwest together. You were like working on one of your first startups. Um, And I just remember like, I I was thinking about it like this morning. I was like, man, I swear Elijah Wood was there like DJing your party. And I was like, what what was going on with that? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't officially our party. We were just sort of a part of it. We had just launched um, a concept called Foremost and we had the cast of Boyhood involved, and a lot of that was filmed around Austin. And so the Austin uh, Film Society were hosting an event, and we uh, were sort of a presenting sponsor as a result. And so uh, Elijah Wood was DJing out of a foremost booth there. Yeah. And uh, we were doing lots of stuff with um, the cast there and everything. And so that was, yeah, I mean, I suppose that was early yeah. on when we first met. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. But, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting because the – the tech startup scene here in Dallas is, I mean, it's pretty tight. Everybody knows kind of everybody, but, um, you know, this, this new startup of yours is like much bigger than anything Dallas could ever take on, like just itself. I mean, this is, this is a big thing. And so I I just want to know, like, what was your kind of original idea behind neighborhood goods? Because, you know, you talked about foremost and a couple of your previous things you were doing. Give us a little bit of background of, you know, what led to neighborhood goods and what was your whole vision behind that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, in many respects, neighborhood gives us sort of a nexus point of a lot of these ideas I've been playing with for years. So um, I think if you look at Need, which was sort of a men's concept we had where we would release a collection every month featuring, um, you know, 10 to 15 different products, many of which were exclusive to us, very editorially driven. It's almost like a shoppable men's magazine. So very editorial there. And then we had Foremost, which was men's and women's clothing that we released almost as a series of... um, capsule collections alongside film we shot with different uh, prominent people sometimes short films sometimes uh, interviews lots of different formats um and then you know outside of that i had started a sort of pseudo non-profit with another local dallas entrepreneur called uh, brian deluca uh, where we provide free resale and event space to independent entrepreneurs and artists every holiday season and so i think you look at neighborhood goods uh, where we're trying to create sort of a you know, in essence, a new type of department store. And so we're playing with a very sort of editorial element. We're playing with a lot of different mixed media. We're playing, obviously, with physical retail, and it very much represents this sort of cross-section of all these different ideas. And that was, honestly, that was the genesis of it. So um, in early 2017, I was approached by my now business partner, a guy called Mark Masinta. Uh, Mark has a much more impressive background than me. He helped... Uh, Steve Jobs and Ron Johnson sort of conceive of the initial Apple Store concept. He was a founding investor in Restoration Hardware. And his group, which is Dallas-based, has about 
you know, 15 or 20 people on the team, but they do all the real estate work for Apple, J. Crew, Madewell, uh, Lululemon, yeah. uh, Warby, Bonobos. They helped a lot of those brands get into physical retail. And he sort of came to me with this essay prompt question based off the experience with Unbranded and said, you know, what do you think could be done differently? Yeah. And, here we are. No, that's so awesome. I mean, and so what's interesting is like you fast forward, like, so 2017, the Atlantic comes out, you know, you're talking retail and you're talking department store right now. And in 2017, the Atlantic was like, okay, we're in the middle of this retail apocalypse, right? It's like literally the death. And, and I'm sure you like have heard this a hundred times, right? Right. But you know, everybody talks about we're in this middle of this retail apocalypse. And honestly, if you look at like a lot of the big department stores, even here in Dallas or based here in Dallas, like we look at them and we're like, these guys are not going to be around in the next five years, like literally not going to be around at all. And, and so there's been this surgence of like these digitally native vertical brands, direct consumer, everything is kind of shifted to e-commerce, but, but retail, is it, is it really dead? I mean, is it, are we really in an apocalypse? Like, because I mean, clearly you're, you're starting up a retail department store. Um, that's a little bit different. We're going to talk about that in a sec, but like, why, why retail if, or, or, or do you feel like we're really in a, an apocalypse? Yeah, no, I mean, actually, that, that article from The Atlantic, yeah. you sort of jogged my memory. It was in the initial pitch deck uh, for our concept, taking quotes from that. And I think, you know, the, the general recognition we have about the market and a lot of people have around the market, not just us, um, is that the vast majority of transactions in this industry still occur in the physical space, not online. And online is increasing proportionately every year, but it's not in line to sort of overtake physical transactions anytime soon, particularly in the sort of apparel world, um, different for some tech products and things like that. Um, and I think for the direct consumer brands, they're sort of in many respects going after a very sort of traditional idea. You know, they're trying to do one thing really well. Mm -hmm. They're trying to focus on that narrative piece and developing and fostering and engendering a general sense of trust between the brand and the consumer. Yeah. I think um, what they're all seeing is they've all raised a huge amount of money. Well, a lot of them have. Mm -hmm. Customer acquisition cost is rising. Uh, lifetime value is dropping. And a lot of them are seeing that physical retail is becoming this sort of new marketing and advertising channel that sort of is a potential uh, mechanism through which they might be able to resolve those sort of various economic discrepancies. And so... For us, you know, a lot of what we're doing, it is a very traditional idea. We're trying to go into physical retail when a lot of people in the prevailing narrative is that the industry is dead. Um, I think, you know, Steve Dennis, who's another Dallasite, yeah. uh, was commenting on the industry and he said that um, uh, retail isn't dead, boring retail is dead. For sure. And I think that's, uh, the, you know, that, that's become a very sort of common sort of statement. But I think it is true that I think a lot of brands are beholden by sort of legacy systems, older sort of business models. And so they're working on a little bit of a sort of a, an antiquated format that's um, not entirely relevant to brands these days that don't want to wholesale and don't want to sort of go into something without capturing a certain amount of information. And so uh, for us right now, it's sort of been a stroke of good timing. You know, yeah, the, the, no, that's true. The market's ready for it. And um, it's just a good opportunity out there in front of us. So, so with that being said, like, you know, what we've seen on this is a lot of these, like you mentioned, like these digitally native vertical brands. Um, and, and what's interesting is you guys are backed by, uh, forerunner ventures specifically and, uh, Kirsten green, who like everybody in the, in the VC world, like tr tr truly respects. And if you don't like, then it's like, just look at a, look at her list of her por portfolio and her team's portfolio on that. And everything from Warby to Glossier to, um, Dollar Shave Club. I mean, you, you name it, Hems. like there's so many brands. It's like name a really cool brand that you think is doing awesome stuff on digital really well. And that's super dialed into their audience. Um, Forerunners invested in those companies, and so they've actually invested in you guys as well. And so, what's interesting is is that you know most of the brands that they're invested into are uh, digitally led brands. They're uh, hyper customer centric. They're they're really focused on their customer over the building. It's not product centric or brand centric. It's more about like they're so empathetic and they understand their customer that it's like that that's how they're leading their brand. It's, it's being digitally led, but also dial it into their customers. So the one thing I was going to ask, you know, like 
forerunner, like on this investing you guys, and I know a lot of people listening on this, you know, are, uh, there's a lot of people in the tech world, but then there's a lot of people that have no clue that there's kind of like a couple of VCs that are really dialed into these type of companies. Um, and, and for them, like forerunner, like if you take a brand like, you know, Dollar Shave Club, for instance, who is, you know, very much an e-commerce play and all the, a lot of these brands honestly are e-com plays. Like what was the whole reasoning behind saying, no, 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 we're, we're going to look at this retail experience and why, why would, why would a group like forerunner want to invest in, in this whole, this concept? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, before Kirsten invested, you know, you talk about Dollar Shave Club, the founder of Dollar Shave Club was one of our first investors as well. Um, we've brought in a lot of different people from that world. And so, uh, Kirsten, was one of the first people to know about the idea. Um, Mark and I had met a few times. He had taken me out to Legacy West, which is where we are now open. And uh, it was a project he helped co-develop and curate from a real estate perspective. And he took me into the vacant space where we are now open and said, you know, what would you do with this? And I wrote up this document that he pseudo lovingly refers to as my manifesto. <laughs> and he took that unbeknownst to me to, to Kirsten. And uh, I went and sat down with her and sort of said, you know, his the sort of broad concept and she was very excited about it and what got her excited about it I think as with a lot of other people in the space I think we can only take so much credit because I think a lot of people were sort of circling around this idea um I think what got her excited about it and she would be able to tell you better than I can but um was something to the effect that we were pursuing physical retail from a very traditional perspective Mm -hmm. her feeling was that a lot of people were going after this market with a focus on more screens and trying to sort of create frictionless experiences and lots of very sort of buzzy ideas right Right. um but no one was actually really focused on the experience and actually on like because people talk about experiential retail being very important and people read that and hear that as meaning like oh well let's put a slide in the store sure and it's not actually focused on let's actually make a really dignified and positive experience for people that just want to shop or come and spend time and so she liked that we were sort of approaching it from this very traditional sort of merchant-oriented perspective where we were going to curate brands, where we were going to create a very specific experience. And then having looked at her portfolio, you know, as you've rightly identified, Glossier, mm-hmm. you know, Dollar Shave Club, Away, Outdoor Voices, you name them, she had seen from some of the more well-established ones like Warby and Bonobos that physical retail can be incredibly meaningful. Yeah. Um, and so for Warby and Peloton now, Peloton not being in the portfolio... Um, they are known as direct to consumer brands, you know, digitally native brands, Mm -hmm. but they now generate more revenue from their stores than they do from the web. Which is awesome. That's, that's so remarkable. One of the things she, she mentioned like in in an article, I think on TechCrunch about you guys specifically is community and emotional connection are a big part of what drives consumer spending. Um, and that's something that you and, um, you know, Mark specifically understand wholeheartedly. That is what she said specifically. So I, I thought that was really interesting around community and the emotional connection to, to brands and, and what they're really dialed into. Um, I, I, I think she sees that bigger vision where, where retail plays as a huge key of, of driving the success for those brands. So with that being said, you mentioned shops at Legacy. So for people that are outside of the, the DFW Metroplex um, on, on that like that's in Plano Texas of all places right and so I'm curious like of all places um, it's like if you're going to start a retail that's kind of non-traditional very data informed we're going to talk about that in a little bit but why Plano over like San Francisco or New York or I don't know a a place where you would think it's like well yeah that's where you need to put this kind of retail environment is San Francisco or whatever but why Plano yeah I mean when, if you'd listened, when it, probably when I was first talking to Kirsten, and yeah. we have lots of great consumer VCs, you know, Maveron, CAA, Thrive, Revolution. I mean, they represent some of the biggest sort of investors in that space. Global yeah. Founders Capital has read, led our most recent round or two, and they've uh, been the capital for like 90% of away so far, and lots of other really exciting ones out of Europe. Um, you know, when we started talking to them, I was pre-apologizing before I said Plano aloud. You know, I was sort of saying, yeah, we're going right? to do it in Texas. And yeah. they were sort of nodding, saying, oh, that's that's unique, but fine. And then yeah. I'm sort of nice joke. Go, getting into sort of the specifics and metrics of the place before actually saying it. Um, <laughs> but honestly, it became one of the most popular elements of what we're doing. And I think it's because I, I and it's become very core to the thesis of what we're doing is that um, 
any of these brands can open a store in Soho, New York, where there's a huge amount of vacant space, there's motivated landlords, they're not wanting to do longer term deals and lose money, but they're happy to do shorter term deals and lose sure. money to get attention and good foot traffic to potentially leverage longer term deals. Yeah. Um, but for a lot of these brands, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth in general <laughs> tends to represent or be one of the top five markets or at worst top 10. And so in terms of accessing a hungry customer, Texas is a great place to do it. Dallas in particular is a great place to do it. And then if you actually look at the sort of raw density of a lot of those customers, you start looking in Plano. And so Legacy West is a brand new development as a spinoff of the shops at Legacy. And it has, you know, it's a three and a half billion dollar mixed use development. Uh, Warby, Bonobos, Peloton, a lot of these brands, they're already there. Yeah. Um, And doing extremely well. They extraordinarily well. That's awesome. And so in terms of an opportunity to go do something different and alone and apart and offer an opportunity for these brands to get into a market that would otherwise be a lower priority for them, you know, what what a better way for these brands to get into one of these markets and for us to launch a new concept than to sort of get into this sort of place, um, introduce these new ideas for people and be a very sort of affordable, playful and low risk mechanism to do it. And then, you know, of course we go do New York, LA, sure. San Francisco, Chicago, where, wherever afterwards. But as a great proving ground, going into some of these suburban markets in the US, Plato and beyond, um, is going to be a really important thing for us and a really important thing for brands. Yeah, I mean, it's it, and that makes complete sense. I mean, if you look at like a brand like Away, Away, you know, those bags, I mean, in, in New York, it could, that's like a household brand now. It's like everybody knows Away, but in, in Plano, it's like, well, that maybe is not so saturated. So like from a validated learning type model to test the waters there in a place that these brands are not necessarily known uh, uh, as well. Um, I mean, honestly, that, that makes sense as well. So, but, you know, speaking about the space real fast, like this space is not like, you know, a 600 square foot pop-up. I, I think some people think, oh, well, neighborhood goods, it's, it, it's just a pop-up or whatever. And it's not like the, it, this is a true, like experience is, is key word here for sure. But like, how big is this thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, yeah, it's definitely not a pop-up, but we did, <laughs> we have about 14,000 square feet Golly. and it's on a, you know, a very sort of big kid, 10 year or 15 year lease. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we need a certain amount of size and we sure. see it, we, like one of the important things early on, I remember people sort of, uh, giving us a little bit of caution and saying, well, why don't you do this in two, 3000 square feet? Um, you can get a short term deal, whatever it is. Uh, the thought, you know, for us was to go and do it. If we were going to do it, we should do it. Uh, the right way and yeah. make a big statement. And, go big or go home. Right. And, when, <laughs> and really, because I mean, if you're yeah. going to come out with something, you know, ambitious as a statement as saying um, you're going to develop a new type of department store. Sure. You kind of need some space. And so even at 14,000 square feet, it's, it's a lot for those of us that uh, don't spend that much time in the space, but for a typical department store, it's pretty small. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's it's a great size. We got about thirty brands in there, which is a little bit more than we were expecting. And wow. we continue to have um, lots more launching with us and testing with us. We got our own restaurant inside. You know, all sorts of different elements. Yeah, I had coffee in there last week. It was nice. it was great. Um, I, I'm curious, like on this, how do you look for like what are you looking for? I guess is a question. Like, what are you looking for in brands that, that you're curating? Because essentially, you're like a master curator of the, the. You know, it's it's not like every brand can just roll in here and 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 have some shelf space or something. Like, what are you doing? And uh, uh, as part of your process for the brands that you bring in, um, is it you reaching out to them saying, Hey, do you want to be in here or how are you vetting this? Like what, what does that look like now? Yeah, honestly, it's, um, it's not entirely scientific process. I mean, when we first went out to start talking to brands, I mean, I was the only full-time person on the team into sort of midway through July, 2018, and we launched in November, 2018. And so in the early days, a lot of it was me, uh, well, we did the initial announcement around our initial piece of funding that was led by Forerunner, mm-hmm. and we had a lot of inbound interest there. Um, and then it was Mark and I on the road going to visit a lot of other ones that we knew uh, from our prior lives. Uh, there were some brands that we knew now through the respective portfolios of our investors, and there were others that were, had just reached out and were expressing interest. And you know, from there, you know, we've now built out um, a great uh, partnerships team led by a guy called Scott Cooper. And what he's doing is spending a lot of time looking at inbound interest as well as, um, you know, reaching out to people actively that we find interesting 
And the general sort of barrier to entry once we're talking to you is whether or not you have the inclination to do anything interesting with our space. So, you know, you might be a massive name, but you just want to come in and do something really mundane and uninteresting and irrelevant to our market. We'll say no, <laughs> where you might, on the other hand, be a completely unheard of brand new brand that's never raised any capital. You're just sort of just getting off the ground. But you have a remarkably good product and you have something you want to do that's very interesting and unique for neighborhood goods. We'll probably be really motivated to explore that. And so... You know, it's about finding a certain amount of balance between different product categories in as much as we are a department store, or call ourselves that, which is really an imperfect way of thinking about it. <laughs> we um, we do want to have a balance of different product categories and price points. And so um, you sort of end up with a little bit of organizational structure around thinking, all right, oh, we need, you know, three to five men's brands. We sure. need three to five women's brands in the apparel space. And then you also need wellness and beauty and so on. And, and it starts sort of providing a lot of useful parameters around things. But, you know, generally speaking, um, it really comes down to, you know, two, three, four of us at most sitting around and sort of saying, well, what about this one? And yeah. thinking about it from that sort of perspective it starts to get a lot more, com- uh, you know, confusing and complicated as we look to expand. Yeah. But, um, for now, it's it's relatively sort of straightforward. No, it's interesting. Well, I mean, and these are not just like, you know, run of the mill brands. These are, you know, Draper James and Hems and Simple Human and Buck Mason. Like, I mean, these are like, le- I mean, all very legit, great brands. Sonos is a part of this. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, you guys have brought in a plethora of, amazing uh, brands overall, but a lot of these brands are not accessible. Like I, I, I've, you know, I was thinking about it. It's like, you know, a lot of these brands until I first went in there, like I had never actually even tangibly, you know, touched that brand or, or like interacted with the product in any way. And so like, um, I thought that was really interesting because it, it's like, these are these brands that like somebody, uh, some of these brands, I felt like, you know, just popped up overnight and we're an e-com site and it's like that's a legit product but you're you're in the consideration phase of that customer journey and you're like "Ah, i don't know if i want to buy that yet but literally what neighborhood goods did is kind of push me beyond the consideration phase and really help me on the conversion side like as a customer to actually buy a product so i think that was uh you know, th- those are a lot of those are digitally native brands that are, that are not accessible. So I think that's interesting. Um, so when you were talking about, you know, we're talking about traditional retail on the other end of this, and one thing that traditional retailers um, are are really lacking is is not the lack of data, but but I think it's being data informed and leveraging that data to make uh, good decisions and pivoting their brand um, based on what the data is actually telling them. So how important, I mean, I, I think that's got to be a huge play for you guys. Like how important is data overall? And I hate using data in a generalization kind of way, in a general way, but I, I do think that, you know, it's really important in the world of neighborhood goods. Like, and, and what are you guys doing in the form of data right now to learn more about your customers and, and what they're doing? Yeah, I mean, so at first I would say that, you know, when we were first conceiving of the concept, um, it was important for us to recognize that um, for brands coming into something like this, that they wouldn't go into it without some sort of vision into the sort of data they could capture, and that they didn't have the opportunity to do that through their own pop-ups. It would be too expensive or prohibitive to do so. Sure. But uh, in doing something with us, it would be this incredibly important element that might provide something much different and unique for them. And so um, you know, it was this recognition that for brands, it's not necessarily... Physical retail isn't necessarily to do with transactions as it has been typically, but it has much more to do with um, customer acquisition and product testing and informing broader strategies. So in as much as we could capture that data, it would be important. Um, So we started looking at how we could do that. And so we have 30 cameras deployed in the room or just under uh, that are capturing... At the entrances, they capture the demographics of people coming into the room, and then the other cameras are capturing... Uh, traffic and sort of behavioral insights. So uh, on a per brand basis, we're able to say um, who's going into those spaces, the general demographics, why, and sort of try to approximate that sort of data and heat map it. So we can start to say, you know, that your merchandising strategy might be offered, that this product is not resonating. And we pair that together with very anecdotal feedback we get from our store staff. Um, We staff the whole thing ourselves rather than letting the brands do it. And so as a result, we get to have a little bit more of a sort of a controlled perspective there so um how long did it take you for this vision to kind of come to life though like i mean so 
kind of everybody talks about the road of a startup and like building something new and everything. So if you go back on this, what what did that look like for you to really, you know, the original thought all the way through? Like, I think people want to know, like, how long did it take you to build something like this? Uh, so that meeting with Kirsten, when I first I had just come up with the name Neighborhood Goods, I'd written up my sort of little manifesto of things. Um, that was probably May 2018 or thereabouts. Yeah. Um, and then we ended up launching, oh, sorry, May 2017. 17, yeah. And then we ended up launching on November 17th, uh, 2018. And so it was, you know, a year and a half yeah. or thereabouts. Um, that was from sort of early idea to capital raise to lease sign to building the thing, building out the team, getting the brands. I mean, it went relatively quickly when you look at it like that. Yeah. But for me, it feels like it, feels like it went relatively at a, a relatively modest pace. Yeah. But I suppose that's pretty common. No, so from a hurdle perspective, I mean, as we all go through a lot of hurdles, like it, I mean, it's not as easy as just like be able to be like, I have this idea, I'm going to go raise capital. And then it's like, here you go and bye. You're off to the races. Like, what are some of those hurdles? Like, I mean, if you're talking to other entrepreneurs, uh, other people that are growing their companies and everything out there, like, what are the, some of those hurdles that you had to overcome um, specifically? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the first would be raising capital yeah. and sort of getting people to sort of buy into it. Fortunately, uh, you know, as I say, very little to do with us and much more to do with good timing. People were sort of excited about this sort of concept. Um, and so we had a lot of just initial buy into what we were doing on the back of people being ready for this sort of idea. Um, and then, you know, we've ended up raising a lot since, which is just partially due to the momentum. I think, you know, one of the next sort of challenges was to sort of um, announce the thing and sort of articulate the message in a way that made sense. So right. um, we started calling ourselves a department store with a story, um, which is a tagline that our intern came up with, actually. Really? Yeah. And That's the, awesome. the whole sort of thing was, you know, that whole exercise was how could you take this thing um, that's a relatively broad idea, anything from this media aspect of food to retail um, to the data capture piece and synthesize it. And we ended up just trying to go with something incredibly simple and straightforward. And I think a lot of the inspiration there was that one of my working names for the company back in the day was Department Store. And so <laughs> it started coming along from there. And then, uh, you know, from there, you know, the big one probably was um, trying to get some degree of social validation and create that sort of movement around brand signing up. So, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to get your sort of last five brands, but it's quite difficult to get your first five. And yeah. so we had to sort of start the process of proving that people were buying into this idea and people were excited about it. And we were very fortunate to have a lot of inbound interest. And again, good timing that a lot of people were trying to get into physical retail. And so, you know, uh, Draper James, the inside stadium goods, um, hymns, uh, all four on a portfolio yeah, of brands. Exactly. And then, you know, a lot of the other ones that are there are backed by some of our other investors. And so that certainly helped. Um, you know, we've had uh, Serena Williams brand there. Yeah. And, and that's know. part of the experience. I was going to say Serena came and you're, yeah. you're having different people come and, and kind of talk about their different brands. Like, I mean, that that's part of these activations. Like, it seems yeah. like every week you guys have different really like out of the box activations that are happening. I mean, and Serena Williams talk about like, you know, in the middle of Plano, Texas, like why is Serena here? Mm -hmm. And then like it, it really from a discoverability, like of what neighborhood goods is all about. I think yeah. that's really cool. Yeah. I mean, Tell she, us about that. Yeah. I mean, she showed up, she's, she's an investor of ours. Yeah. Um, she showed up and helped us set up before we launched. Um, she's just very involved. She's, awesome. she's very involved with the brand. And you know, that's why we got excited about it. You know, of course, you know, it's a good example of what I was saying earlier. You know, it's, it, of course it's Serena, um, it would be great to do something with her and her brand. You yeah. know, she's so well respected and well regarded, but she also had a very specific perspective about what she wanted to do and wanted to come in and help and create something special. That's and cool. she had a plan around uh, launching um, her Serena Great line, which is a size inclusive line uh, with Neighborhood Goods. And she ended up doing it as a surprise podcast appearance with Ashley Graham, the model. Um, they recorded the final episode of Ashley's podcast live at Neighborhood Goods in huh. our sort of second or third week of being open. And um, it was pretty wild. We had a huge amount of people sort of uh, camped out outside in the rain, sort of looking through the window. We had people trying to sneak in through the back door. We had <laughs> uh, the police there really panicking. And uh, we uh, it was a lot of fun. But it's I mean, a lot that's, of attention going on in Plano. That's, yeah, that's but, wild. That's but, cool. But that's very much like what we want to do. And yeah, so, that's like, awesome. you know, that's, that's how we're talking to these brands. And that's, you know, you talk about like hurdles on the way. You know? Yeah. That's one of them is, you know, how do you articulate this message? How do you get people thinking thoughtfully about it? The only other one I would mention um, 
is that building physical things is hard. Like launching a website for if you're a direct to consumer brand, if you want to launch a website, you know, spinning up a Shopify instance sure. or whatever it is is relatively straightforward. Right. And then, you know, obviously you have to develop your product and get yeah. it to the right place. But physical spaces are hard. And, you know, I think a lot more people are wanting to play around in the physical space, but it's so still um, antiquated in how they do business. And so, yeah. you know, I remember the initial sort of document I wrote out. Uh, I was talking about how long it would take to open the thing. And I thought we very firmly would have opened in 2017. Oh, um, really? Wow. Well, because I mean, like, oh, yeah, no well, in my we mind, it was, you know, how long could it possibly take? Yeah, I mean, we have sure. 14,000 vacant square feet here. You know, it's not going to take that long to design and build. Sure. But then, you know, we then decided to do our own fixtures to yeah. come up with all this sort of thoughtful oh, yeah. stuff. And so. And you have an app actually that like yeah. is integrated within the experience itself. It like knows where you're at in the store and it's like super dialed in right there. So yeah. that's a part of the experience as yeah, well, I right? Mean, that, that's, that's, you know, what the, the, the sort of overarching perspective. So from, you know, we talk about the tech and data piece and, sure. we, and, we, and sort of, you know, there's, on the one hand, it's informing brands. So they're used to sort of A-B testing online. This helps them do it in physical and give them sort of general sort of useful and actionable data that they would otherwise not have. And That's then on the other side of it, what it allows the customer to do and what it allows our staff to do is um, sort of allow for people to interact with the room on their own terms. So if you think about physical shopping in general and retail in general, I think a lot of people have forgotten or have failed to recognize that it's, a, it's sort of an inherently pretentious and sort of alienating experience. Yeah. And so if you can allow for people to come in and have people come to them on their own terms or shop on their own terms or, you know, use a barcode scanner, or they're sitting in our restaurant and have product brought to them or, you know, in-store pickup, all these sort of table stakes things that a lot of, you know, well-established brands still really struggle to implement that re results in something really meaningful for people. And so that was very much the focus of the app. It was that, you know, it wasn't going to be a compulsory element of the experience, but it would unlock a lot of things that would be very unique to you and to that experience. And so, yeah, I mean, that's what we mean yeah. when we talk about experiential retail is just treating people with a little bit more dignity and respect. That makes sense. So when did you know that this concept would be successful? I still don't know that. <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, we've been open now for just a little bit and yeah. Um, you know, we've been very fortunate. I think we've raised now over $15 million of seed funding. Um, and we have a lot of really great investors like Kirsten. Um, and we have lots of really great people that are sort of partnered with us and very sort of involved with what we're doing. We have lots of brands that are really motivated to get into the space, both of the direct consumer variety and also really well established brands as well. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we certainly sort of hit something that resonates with a lot of people, but sure. now it's an executional question. And so we're working on expanding into five or six markets over the next sort of 14 to 16 months all over the country. Um, we'll raise more money in that time. We'll sign a lot more brands in that time. Um, I think as long as we continue to do something different and relevant in each of those markets, we'll find something important and successful. Um, you know, I think, you know, retail a lot of it is really an economy of relevance. And I think a lot of people have not been trading in that for quite some time. And so in as much as we can do something meaningful and relevant uh, in each of these markets and, and sort of unique, then I think we remain in an interesting position. Absolutely. No, that's great. I mean, honestly, that's really good feedback um, uh, for retail and where the kind of the state of retail overall, uh, future of retail. Um, you've added a lot of really good insights just today um, on this. So quick question for you. So a lot of people are always talking. So this is the Growth Hack podcast. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, as far as like when we talk about uh, tools and tactics and kind of getting into it, I, I think you guys had a really at the front end had a really good tight brand strategy and good go to market strategy overall. So I think having the right strategy is really, really important. And, and, and that's been proven into your execution. But from a tactical standpoint, um, when you talk about tools, um, this is kind of one that I, I have to bring up is like, what what uh, tools have you seen that you just use on a daily basis or your team or whatever else uses that, um, you know, has has made you guys more efficient or it's kind of like one of those hacks for you guys? What What's the one tool that you're kind of going to right now? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, we use a lot. If, to be okay. totally honest, like if everything we use is pretty sort of cloud informed. So, you know, we use, uh, we built a lot of the connective tissue between a lot of industry standard platforms. So like the cameras we use to capture the data inside the store are done by Retail Next. Uh, we use Shopify for a lot of our sort of e-commerce platform and our POS. But we sort of married that together with our own CMS that's unique to us. And so we do a lot of different things. One of the most important things that I enjoy, I think my team probably hates, is... Um, in Slack, I've set up this thing called a noise channel, and I used it with my last company as well, and I think it's really important. 
And all it is is um, it's a raw feed of all the activity happening with the company at any awesome. given time. And so I tell everyone to mute it because it's just noise. But it's, <laughs> it's a great thing to have open. So it's anything from people applying for jobs to transactions to uh, support requests to tweets to uh, the latest Instagram posts to traffic spikes to download spikes to... You know, you you name it, that's it's awesome. in there. And it's so, got triggers. That's awesome. Yeah, and so it just all runs through Zapier or Zapier, yeah. however you want to pronounce yeah. it. And um, what it does is it just gives us a real time sort of actionable place where we can be responding to these things. And so, like a lot of our business and our general sort of marketing is predicated on PR. And so, you know, our mention.com reports flow straight in there. So we're able to catch PR right as it happens. So our PR firm is emailing us those hits as they happen, but we're typically already you know, aware of them or have been aware of them for a couple of hours before we get those reports. And, sure. and so it just helps us be in a position where we can sort of, you know, simultaneously be focused on the big picture of this sort of big, broad, unwieldy idea, but also be focused on what we can be doing right now and understand, probably importantly, the aberrant moments within that. So we can drive traffic and host these events and have this broader sort of tactical perspective around how we're going to get people into the store and foster this sort of magnetism to what we're doing in neighborhood goods that has very little to do with transactions but responding to what's happening right here and now at any given time is really important and so that raw flow has always been really important for me and and I, I hope it's been important for the team as well but um yeah so that's one that springs to mind and that's kind of a cop-out answer because it means no, it's just sort of that's everything awesome. we're using yeah no I think I think I mean honestly having that big generic kind of roll up just to be it's almost like a a feed of everything. I, I think that's a great idea. I mean, I think that a lot of companies could have a nice roll up of that in the Slack. I mean, that's that's pretty genius. So, um, well, hey, Matt, I just want to thank you again for coming on here. This is Growth Hack Podcast episode one. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what this is going to be like. But thanks again for being our first guest and oh, thank you and being a part of this uh, the journey. So thanks again. Thanks for having me. Hey guys, thanks again for tuning into the Growth Hack Podcast. We hope it will be the place where everyone can gain insights on how to grow your business in the most efficient way based on today's marketing landscape. All links are in the show notes and subscribe here or wherever you listen to your podcasts.